Well, good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Let's see. Get that off. Brother Brandon's going to put the screen up. We're in good shape. Good to see everybody here this morning. It's a little cool, but the sun's shining, and it sure is pretty. Uh, got any birthdays to celebrate? You had one this past Friday? Okay. Is that why you forgot to change your clocks? I have to ask, did anybody accidentally show up for Sunday school today? Anybody know? Huh? It was intentional. It was intentional. Uh, that's so funny. And nobody's here when I get here about 10 after 8, and I come rolling in. There's Donnie and Donna. <laughs> That, that's it, a day, a year older. All right, so Donnie's having a birthday. Anybody else? Uh oh, big, big Larry B's having one. Well, we had one today. Oh wow. Anybody else? Birthdays? Any more birthdays? How about anniversaries? No anniversaries. Well, we got a couple to sing happy birthday to then. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday, God bless you, happy birthday to you. All right, uh, a couple announcements that I want to mention. Hopefully you were able to um, uh, uh, see some of the announcements on the, the overhead this morning, so I won't mention everything, but a couple things I want to point out. Uh, today we begin our uh, children's offering uh, this month. We'll, we'll be taking it up uh, the entire month of November. Uh, our goal is $1,000, and all the money will go to Ebenezer Christian Children's Home. And uh, the church decided to send the money that route this year. And so um, uh, next Sunday we'll have the, the march so we'll have to make sure we've got plenty of kids here to help us do the, do the march. And so bring, uh, as always, uh, coins, dollar bills, checks, $100 bills, whatever. <laughs> and uh, so let's meet our goal. Um, it was $800 last year. We met it. So let's try to meet this goal of $1,000. And uh, we can't do it without you guys, but it's certainly a worthy cause to give an Ebenezer Christian children's home because essentially we're giving those kids hope. And, uh, you know, many of you do not know how it feels, just like I don't know how it feels. Some of you may very well know, uh, but I do not know how it feels to have a mother or a father who doesn't want me, to have a mom and dad that would rather do drugs than be with me, or abuse me. Now, my daddy abused me when I was young. He beat the far out of me. <laughs> I deserved every lick I got, I guarantee you. It's like starting a lawnmower, that belt come out. It's like starting a Briggs and Stratton. But uh, anyway, uh, these um, it's such a worthy cause. Ebenezer does such a good work. It's not a perfect system. It's not. But I tell you what, they do such a good work, and those house parents and all the works, the ones that works down there. So uh, certainly you can give today if you come prepared for that. I did. But um, uh, next week we will certainly have the, the march. I always enjoy that. Okay, uh, a couple other things in the bulletin you'll see getting to, there toward the end for uh, uh, the uh, ordering the knives. Uh, from the Women on Mission, so if you'll see about that. But also, on the second page of your bulletin, coming up November the 10th and the 17th, uh, the Women on Mission ladies will be having a fundraiser and a fellowship after church each day, each Sunday. Uh, they're going to have things like nuts, candy, flavoring, crocheted, uh, crocheted items, <laughs> uh, crocheted items, and uh, that'll all be to raise money. Uh, for missions, and so just take note of that and make sure you bring you some cash or your checkbook with you on that. Uh, any other 
particular announcements we need to mention this morning? Anything? All right, then, Brother Isaac, we'll get started. Let's all stand and sing hymn number 142. Fifty four. As we go to the Lord in prayer this morning, we want to lift up some special concerns. David Rubino called me a while ago. Terry is really sick this morning. Uh, her breathing is still do, progressing and, and doing pretty good. And so that's that's certainly important. But she is really sick. I've uh, been throwing up a lot this morning. And so uh, I wanted prayer for Terry. What other prayer concerns do we have this morning? Virgil. All right. Remember Virgil? 
everybody going to the beach, safe travels down there today and coming back Thursday. Just let me remember Mark this morning, been sick, and uh, so hopefully he'll get better soon. Yeah, let's continue to remember uh, Tommy's wife and kids. Yes, keep Matt and Hauk in your prayers as well, that family. It's still a sad situation. We're talking about the wreck that was down at the bridge. It's just, just a sad, sad situation for everybody concerned. Judy? All right, Justin McNeil. All right, let's remember Miss Patsy. Let's remember, continue to remember Cheryl. She recuperates. Miss Geraldine as well. Oh, all right, Amanda's mother in law, Barbara. Her Robert and Lois, her, her brother in law. All right. Still remember Donnie, right? Crystal Little's mother passed away. Okay, so remember her. Okay. And those may have unspoken. You got those on your heart and your mind this morning? All right. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to bow to come before the throne of grace this morning. Lord, we know that we can only do that uh, through the blood of Jesus. Because we are righteous, because we are holy, through Jesus' sacrifice and His blood, we are able to come before You today. And Lord, let us not take it lightly that we're coming before the throne of grace. God, I pray that You will bless these prayer requests. You know the situation and you know what needs to be done. And so therefore we pray, Lord, that your will would be accomplished. Now God, now as we come into this uh, time of prayer and time of worship, Lord, we know that even those here today are battling and dealing with many things. We pray, Lord, that you will lead us to hand those things over to you. Many of us have unspoken. We have friends and family that are struggling, and we lift those up to you today. We lift this service, Lord, that you might be glorified, that we might lift up the name of Jesus, and that we might leave here today knowing that we've been in a place where we've come to worship you. Let us get these things out of our mind. Lord, let us focus our attention now upon you. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand again and sing hymn number 338. Wonderful words of life, beautiful words. 
Brandon, would you lead us in this prayer?
right to sing. Are you singing solo? Talk to your people, brother. Get your people in line, Isaac. Go ahead. Go ahead. All right, if you all want to stand and we'll sing, I am holding on to you. Middle and the storm. 
If you'll take your Bibles this morning and turn to Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19, I'm going to be looking from verses 8 through following and speaking sort of on this focus about being over overcomers, being bold, being overcomers, and being bold. So we begin this week with a powerful kick right from the get-go. Uh, it's a powerful message for every single one of us, and it's a challenge for every single one of us. I want you to look at verse 8 first, Acts chapter 19, and just look first at verse 8. Scripture says this, it's about Paul. And he went into the synagogue, and he spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. Now I think our time that we live in today calls for us as Christians to speak boldly again. I would say amen there, but I don't want your response right now. I think our time calls for us as Christians to speak boldly again, thus saith the Lord. I'm not talking about our opinion. I'm not talking about tradition. I am talking about thus saith the Lord. There's not a one of us here today ought to be ashamed of what the Word of God says. What the Word said then, the Word says now. It, it, it'll never change. God never changes. And so I think it's time for Christians to speak boldly again. Because that's exactly what Paul did. And I want to see this morning how Paul handled this situation. Because Scripture tells us in verse 8 that he went into the synagogue and he spoke boldly. But I want to tell you why. Because then we can go back to chapter 18. Just one chapter over. We just covered this. Because back in chapter 18, verses 9 and 10, God did what? He came to Paul at night in a vision. And he said to Paul, Go back in chapter 18, verse 9. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision, Be not afraid, and hold not thy peace. So, because God said that, and He says in verse 10, He said, I'm with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. We've already preached about that and took that, but you take that information, and now we see why Paul is the kind of man that can go into the synagogue and speak and preach boldly, thus saith the Lord. That's a challenge for us. You say, well, I'm, I'm really not in a place in my life 
where I can uh, speak boldly. Why? You're not speaking boldly what you're saying. I found people care very little what I have to think about things. You know? And so we all have our different opinions. So we're not speaking boldly what we think. Now, people do that. You know anybody does that? Gosh, I told you not to answer a while ago. That doesn't apply for the rest of the service. I know a lot of people that, that are very bold and loud and they want you to know their opinion. And they think their opinion is right, therefore they want you to know your opinion. I know plenty of people who speak boldly. And I believe that you can speak boldly without screaming and hollering and, and all that. But the fact of the matter is, that's what the Bible tells us to do. So... I want to see just for a few minutes today how Paul handled this. Now, just for information's sake, uh, Paul stayed in Ephesus for approximately two years or so, maybe a little more, and uh, for the most part, it's not his pattern to do that. He would stay a short time, but there's a time in which he stayed somewhere for like 18 months, and then here in Ephesus, he stayed a couple years. So there are a couple places where he stayed for for a little bit of time. A lot of places he was just there for just a week, maybe a couple days, and move on. But t Paul stayed in Ephesus for a while. Uh, there was a lot of work to be done here in this city. Uh, the city of Ephesus at this time had a population of about 300 thousand people and uh, it was the capital of the Roman province here in this area in Asia so uh, we kind of set the stage there and now we go into this um, to the meat of the sermon and the first thing we're going to look at is Paul's opportunity how many knows this morning that God gives us opportunities right we all do God gives us opportunities I'm amazed really at the opportunities that God does give us but i want to look at paul's opportunity look at verse 11 the bible says there that god wrought many miracles uh by the hands of paul now i don't know what kind of hands paul had had he was a tent maker he is a worker i suspect he had some calluses uh, i'm sure he had rough hands but it wasn't the size it wasn't the shape of Paul's hands, it was the power of God working through Paul's hands that these special miracles are wrought. I think some people over the years maybe have thought, well, God's given them this special power. We forget that God works through us. And when God no longer wants to work through us, He'll stop working through us. But as long as He wants to work through us, his power, and he can, he can bring many, many things through us. So here's what uh, Paul had to say about this time. We can go over to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 16. I'll just read verses 8 and 9. If you want to go there, fine, but if you might want to jot it down and look at this a little bit later. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 8 and 9, Paul talks about the time in which we're, what we're reading about here in Acts. And he says this, But I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost. Verse 9, and listen closely. For a great door and effectual is open unto me, and there are many adversaries. This is Paul's challenge. This is Paul's opportunity. Paul understands, he recognizes that this door in which he speaks of is a door of opportunity. And so I've already asked you that question. So hopefully we're thinking that God gives us doors of opportunity all the time. If you're here today and says, well, I've never paid any attention. I, I don't know that God's opened any doors of opportunity for me. Well, you just got to stop and look and see. Because he does every day for all of us. He does that. Uh, Paul, he had this tremendous chance that he couldn't pass out. Here's this large city. Uh, to me... 300,000 people is a, is a lot of people. I don't think I'd care to live in a city where, with, with 300,000 people, much less millions of people. Uh, you know, I, I get crowded in Warrensville. <laughs> and it ain't even a real city. 
So this was a lot of people. But the fact of the matter is, Paul says, man, I've got this opportunity. And I'm going to take advantage of it. I hope we can do that. That's a, that's a door of opportunity. We've got an opportunity right here in, in, in our area, in Ash County, wherever we live. Where, whatever neighborhood you live in, we have doors of opportunity. And you and I need to look for those doors of opportunity. They come throughout the day, all the time. Remember our command? God gave us a command. Love Him first, and then love who? Our neighbors. Lo love others. Love God first and love others. That's our command. And so we can look for doors of opportunity in which to do that. Ephesus was also a great, great city of wickedness. I've said this many times through the book of Acts as we're studying and going through the book of Acts. Because sometimes we think, my Lord, it can't get any worse than it is right now. Listen, our, our time is bad. I get that. But let me, let me share with you a couple more things. See, that's the way it was a couple cities that we've gone to. It was that way in Corinth. And then here we come to this city, Ephesus. It was a city of great wickedness. The morals was terrible. It was a place of spiritual darkness. And Paul because it was such a dark place, Paul brought a light. Because Paul was carrying the light. The Bible says we are the, the children of the light. We're the light of the world. Do we take our light and hide it? I'm afraid some of us does. I'm afraid some of us, when we walk out the door on Sunday, we, we put a little cap on our light. Because we don't want to shine. We don't want to be recognized. But yet, God tells us so many times in Scripture and in His Word that that's exactly what we're supposed to do. Paul saw this place of darkness as a place of opportunity. Christians today, and I'm telling you what, I'm just as guilty of this as any here, anybody here. A lot of times we don't want to be in a dark place. No, dark places are scary. We don't want to be in a place where sin is abounding. We don't want to be in a place where it's, it's unhappy. We want to be filled with joy. We want to be around our Christian brothers and sisters. But at some point in time, God is going to send you to a place of darkness. As we mature, as we're able to handle it, God will send us. He will indeed send you and I to places through His power, Him working through our hands, that we can do mighty great things in that dark place. Did it ever occur to us why God has put us here? I mean, you know, the fact of the matter is, He can just call us on home right now. We can go on to heaven right now. That's where I want to be. Where all those who went in before us, where they're at, that's where I want to be. I want to be in heaven. My he Heaven is my eternal home. And I want to be there. But until God takes me, He's got a mission for me, and He's got a mission for you on this earth. And so that's why God has us here, because this is a dark place. And we carry the light. And there's all kind of light. Maybe you got a little small pin light. Maybe you got a big flashlight. Well, they sure make flashlights bright today, don't they? So, different kind of lights. But what better place for a light to be in a dark room? I mean, you know, I've got a flashlight on my phone. Most people have that, except for the four of you who still has a flip phone. Probably don't have a flashlight on your flip phone. <laughs> what better place for a light to be than in a dark room. Think about it. Now, uh, because Paul did all that, look in verse 10, there's a result. Because God has placed us right at the door and a door of opportunity, the question is, will we walk through it? Paul did. Because look in verse 10. And in, in, in about two years, every single person in the city of Ephesus heard about the Word of God. They heard the Word of God somehow, some way. They heard what God is doing. They heard Paul talk. They heard somebody talking about Paul's teaching. Somehow or the other, in that time span of two years, the light was carried to Ephesus and the light was shown in a dark place. Why? 
because Paul saw a door of opportunity and he walked through it. How about you? Has, has God opened up a door of opportunity and kind of put the stop in there and the door's still open and you're just sitting there like, mm, that's going to be hard for me to walk through. But God's keeping it open. Listen, if he's asking you to do something, you need to do it. You need to do it. Because what he might do is just close that door and you might miss an opportunity. That was the result there. So when we come in here and, and we see in the scripture and we see Paul's opportunity, we're going to come back to that in just a minute, but there's a couple things I want us to look at between. First, or the second thing is Paul's opposition. How many knows we're going to get opposition? You start talking about Jesus. Now you can talk about religious stuff. You can talk about uh, you know, some kind of spiritual thing or some type of religious activity. And if you're pretty wide, if you're not very specific, you can get by with it. You can do that in, in county. You can do that in the city government, county government. You can do that just about anywhere. But you get down right specific talking about Jesus, Him being the way, the truth, and the life. No man may come to the Father but by me. And I'm going to tell you what, you're going to see some opposition. Can't help it. Anybody know that this morning? Remember the verses we looked at just a minute ago in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 9, when Paul, when Paul said, For a great door and effectual is open unto me, and there are many adversaries. There are many obstacles. There's much opposition. God didn't say it's going to be easy. He said, I want you to do it, and I'm going to be with you there every step of the way. My power is going to be available to you every step of the way. So Paul had some opposition there. This was a wicked city. I want to take a few minutes and just jump in here just for a second uh, about this city and about some of the things that the, some of the opposition that Paul faced. So it's a wicked city. So would it surprise you if I said it was a very religious city? It's a very, very, very religious city. It shouldn't because religion is one of the main tools in the devil's tool shed. It is, it is in fact true that she has a she shed, but the devil has a tool shed. And the devil goes in his tool shed and he gets spiritual stuff. And he gets religious stuff. And he uses it. And now you got folks walking around talking about this religious stuff and how great they are and how great this is and how great that is when it's completely separate, completely opposite of what the Bible says. If it's not in the Bible, it's of the devil. If it's not of God, it's of the devil. If God's for it, we ought to be for it. If God's against it, we ought to be against it. It's just that simple. So a couple of things that Paul had to deal with. I'll give you three things uh, that the devil used in this city, and I believe he's still using it today. There's three different kind of religions I want to look at. First of all, inadequate. A religion that is inadequate. There are some people who thinks about God once, once a week. There are some people who thinks about God once a year. There's some people who never think about God once a decade. That's inadequate. If God, the Bible says, pray how often? Unceasing. Just all the time. Everything in prayer. Every aspect of our life. Our family, our work, everything. Everything. We should be asking God how He feels about it and how he, what He wants to do. We should be in His Word finding out. So it's inadequate religion. You see, Paul always took the gospel to the Jews first. And so for three months, for approximately three months, uh, uh, Paul went into the synagogue and he showed them uh, that their religion was inadequate. And the reason, because the Old Testament had a purpose. I preach out of the Old Testament. I read the Old Testament. But we understand that the Old Testament points to somebody. Throughout the whole Old Testament, every, uh, every, every T that's crossed and every I that's dotted, everything leads to not something but someone. And that's Jesus. 
And so the fact of the matter is, uh, their religion at the time was inadequate because the Old, the Old Testament had a purpose, and that was to point them to the coming Messiah. Well, guess what? The Messiah came, but they missed him. They missed him. Jesus had come, but they missed him. In fact, they rejected him. In fact, they killed him. They crucified him. And so their religion was inadequate. If you have a church today, uh, a religion today, if you have a get-together today, and it doesn't have Jesus Christ in the center, it's inadequate. It won't do. Their religion was an empty shell. There was nothing on the inside. Don't ask people if they ever found religion. Ask them if they found Jesus. Because that's what's important. You can talk about religion all day long, and that'll do nothing. Religion will send people to hell, but Jesus will take people to heaven. That's just the way it is. That's the way God intended it. Paul said, don't be satisfied with this ritual, this empty ritual that you go through. How many times do people today walk into a church and go through a ritual? I mean, they'll open their song book and they'll, they'll see the words in there. They'll hear the preacher. They'll sing the songs. But their heart's not even in tune with God. They're just going through a ritual. It's an empty shell. No, we've got to get inside. Now in verse 9, Paul now moves his base of operations from a synagogue. See, he, go, he went to the Jews first. We've already noticed a time or two in our study where he's like, boy, I'm really getting tired of going to these Jews because they ain't listening. And I'm fixing to go to the Gentiles. And so he comes into Ephesus, but he goes to the Jews first. He's teaching. He's preaching in the synagogue. The Bible says he's, he's arguing. He's debating. Anything that he can do to get the Jews to listen to him. But in verse 9, he takes the base of his operation from the synagogue and he takes it to a school. And we would know this pretty much maybe like a storefront church now. Maybe there's a building there. There was a school going on and maybe Paul went in there after hours. Maybe he met early in the morning before they had their school or maybe late at night or maybe it's an extra room. I don't know what the case was, but we know that he moved to a well-known school and he either rented it or they allowed him to use it. So the first thing Paul dealt with was religion or inadequate religion. The second thing he dealt with, verses 11 and 12, he dealt with the imitation religion. This was not the norm. Let's look in verse 11 and 12. Because the Bible says, uh, excuse me, let me change pages. I'm back over in 18. I'll get back at 19. And now verse 11, chapter 19, verse 11. And so Scripture tells us there, And God wrought special miracles by the hand of Paul. Now listen. So that from his body were brought into the sick handkerchiefs, sweat rags. See, I got a sweat rag because I sweat. In case anybody wonders, I have two sides of mine. The outsides for my mouth and the insides for my forehead. In case anybody was thinking I was wiping my forehead and then wiping my mouth and say, that's nasty. I don't do that. I've got a system. And so that's a sweat rag. They sweat on that rag. Got to wash it. Thank you, Scott. Scott gave me this, this rag. This hanky. And, uh, and so uh, that's, it. that's what he's talking about. A handkerchief. An apron, something that he might wear. And the disease departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. And then in verse 13, it says, the certain, the, uh, Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits. Uh, the name of the Lord Jesus said, We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preached to come out. In other words, what's happened is something, it's an imitation. These people don't have the real thing. They said, the Jesus that Paul preaches, we're going to call on his name for that evil spirit to come out of those people. That's imitation right there. But I want us, I want us to see something here. This was not the normal. It is not intended for us to duplicate today. I'm telling you right now, I can pray over my sweat hanky all day long. And at the end of the day, you know what it's going to be? A sweat hanky. That's all it's going to be. 
Okay? If God wants to do something special with it, that's up to Him. But I want us to see here that God was working special miracles. It says there in, in verse 11. And so what we see here, and, and a lot of times throughout the book of Acts, we see God doing special miracles. We, do God, we see God doing special things in a special time in which to validate the truth. Now, Paul was a tent maker. We know that. His clothes would be sweaty. He's a worker. Now, if you're like me, I ain't got to do nothing to sweat. All I got to do is stand up here under that light, and I'll start sweating. And so, you know, Lord, if I do start doing something, now I'm a sweater. And that's, and that's what when Paul worked, he sweat. Many of you work hard, and as you work hard, you sweat. So you understand uh, what, what Paul is saying here. And so sweat was coming off Paul, and so he had wiped the sweat his little apron. He'd put his little apron on and he'd work. And he'd get dirty. See, I believe what God was doing here, uh, as it says, that he would wipe his brow with a handkerchief and they noticed that when somebody come in contact with that sweaty hanky, that they'd be healed of a disease. I mean, you know, We'd probably do the same thing. I mean, if we noticed something was working, we'd be like, mm-hmm. One hanky, 1995. It works. But I believe what God was doing was rebuking a pagan, a pagan sorry, religion. I believe that God was doing something special to show His special power and to rebuke this, because, I, because I studied this, and I want to share just a couple things with you. You see, these pagans here, they were well known for their emphasis on clean garments. I know many of you stay clean all the time. I know people that can walk through a mud puddle and come out clean. Have you seen? I mean, you know, I can go to the door. I'm dirty before I ever leave the house. I mean, I just get dirty. It's just, it don't take nothing for me to get dirty. But some people stay clean. But these people right here, they, they were well known for their emphasis upon clean white garments. Here's why. Because they used them in their rituals. And, and, and everything had to be prim and proper and sparkling white. And I believe that God was saying that your dead religion cannot accomplish anything. I believe God was saying, your pristine white garments are powerless. But I can take this old, nasty, sweaty rag, and I can bring healing. Because it ain't the rag, it ain't the sweat, it's the power of God. And so, it's not us hitting our knees right here at the altar. It's not us laying hands on people. It's the power of God that does the healing. And so, uh, I mean, you know, if God tells me to... Take a sweaty rag to myself. I mean, if I feel like God's told me to do that in my private time, I'll do it. I'll do whatever God tells me to do. Won't you? We see all, you know, you know, God, Jesus told people to go down and wash down by the river and, and just uh, spit on mud and put it on there. It wasn't the mud. It was the power of God. We need to understand today that it's the power of God. Amen? So here's the invitation. This is what Paul was dealing with. In verse 13, I'm going to read you a quick paraphrase. It says this, A group of Jews was traveling from town to town, casting out evil spirits. And they tried to use the name of the Lord Jesus in their incantation, saying, I command you in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, to come out. But verse 15 tells us that they were imitators. That they wasn't a real thing themselves. And I believe some today people are imitators if they don't have Jesus. Because here's what, here's what happened. The evil spirit that was in this man that they were trying to bring out. Alright, this man was possessed with the evil spirit. And this is probably where Wade would have took off. Because it says in verse 15, And the evil spirit answered and said, Whew. Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who are you? So the, the, these people are, are, are trying to use 
the power of the name of Jesus that Paul preaches because they don't know who Jesus is. And so they're like, man, we're going to get up on some of this. Have you ever heard this? Listen, if you'll send me 1995, I'll send you this rag. That's an invitation. If you'll send me $20, I'll go down over to the restaurant, put a little water in a bottle, and I'll send it to you. If everybody will send me $20, I will bring you a little bottle of water. Now, if everybody give me $20, I'll go and do that. But let me tell you, you know what you're going to have inside that little bottle? Water. You'd be better to go across the Dollar General and just get you a bottle of water. Go down to the river. Man, we can make water from the new river. New miracle water from the new river. Boy, we can make a killing, can't we? I tell you what, when I see it on TV, man, you talk about getting angry. Man, I want to reach through that TV and <laughs> the, the, the audacity of some people. But that's what these folks did. They said, you know what? Paul preaches this power for Jesus. So we're going to use this name of Jesus that Paul preaches and we're going to tell this evil spirit to come out. And the evil spirit, spirit turns around to them and says, I know who Jesus is and I know who Paul is, but I don't know who you are. If that's me, I'd be gone. I don't know. Some of you might, might have stood there. <laughs> but that would be the end of my conversation with that evil spirit. And these are not the last people. I've already mentioned folks trying to sell miracle water and prayer cloths. My goodness. This is serious. I want you to look in verse 16. Chapter 19 and verse 16. Look at, that. Look at what happens. And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them. This is what happened next. The man that was filled with the evil spirit jumped on them. And the Bible says there in verse 16 that they had to run out naked and wounded. Okay. Verse 17. And this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus. And fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Many. There, there's a lot there I won't go into, but just understand. It's imitation. Are you, are you worshiping a shell? Is your religion, is your relationship with Jesus a shell? It's because it's religion and not relationship. There's imitation religion. There's also idolatrous religion. Listen, Ephesus had this magnificent temple to Diana. Diana was a goddess that they worshipped. Oh, we don't want to go there. We don't want to go there. Still got one or two kids in here. We don't want to go there. Diana was the goddess of fertility in that culture. All I'm going to say is this. Fornication was part of their worship. These people were sick. These people were crazy. And we think we live in a tough time. That's what Paul was saying. You could go to the temple of Diana and there were hundreds of priestesses that you could purchase. That brings us to the final point. There's a lot there, but I'm not going to go into it here. The final point is this. In verses 23 through 26, we see Paul's overcoming. So he had an opportunity first. He had opposition, right? But now we see how Paul overcame. Look at verse 23. And so uh, in the same time there arose no small stir about that way. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain into the craftsmen, whom he called together with a workman of like occupation and said, Sirs, you know that by this craft we have our wealth. Moreover, you see and hear that, that not alone at Ephesus, but almost all throughout Asia, this Paul hath persuaded and turned away much people, saying that there be no gods which are made by hand. Paul overcame. Here's a man that's making a lot of money because of this priestess, because of the goddess Diana. And he's saying to the rest of the people that's making money off this, he says, this Paul has come and he has persuaded people 
that this is false and people are following this Jesus character and it's costing us money. See, Paul overcame. Paul was teaching in the school of Tyrannius and and, and as I mentioned earlier, maybe we'd call that a storefront church. But the fact of the matter is, you've got this little bitty building right here. And down the street, you've got this huge temple to Diana. And, and uh, uh, I, I began to look that up and see. I mean, it was huge. It had over a hundred huge columns. It was ginormous. But yet, you had this little preacher and a little bitty church making a difference. Turning the tide, making a change to the point where uh, later, after Paul had left Ephesus, uh, the place, the temple burned down. And you know, there wasn't enough people interested to rebuild it because Paul preached in Jesus. The application is this we've seen Paul's opportunity. And just like you and I have opportunities. We've seen Paul, uh, his opposition, just like you and I have opposition today. We have foes. Walk in the workplace and start preaching about Jesus tomorrow. You know, you can walk in there and say, God's so good. Oh, you'll have several people. Oh, yes, he is. God is good. I tell you, we're blessed. Yeah, we are blessed. Jesus saved my soul. I was on my way to hell, and Jesus saved me. Unless you've got some other Christians there. Now, many of us have a wonderful opportunity, got a wonderful workplace. I, you know, I know some of you have Bible studies at work and stuff. We're very fortunate. But I guarantee you a lot of people, you're going to start having foes. You start preaching hard like that. We've seen Paul's overcoming. And just like you, just like Paul, you and I can overcome come so there's an open door will you walk through it heads are bowed and eyes closed father we close uh, this service with a time of uh, application from your scripture from your word god we're reading about what paul did and we know that you used paul in a mighty way and you worked these incredible miracles through his hands but it was your power, the same power that's available today. But God, you chose to do things then that you may or may not do today. But God, I believe you still perform mighty miracles. And Lord, we have everything we need right here in your word. And your Holy Spirit living in us. We have everything. We have the same power. So God, we see what you did with Paul. And this comes to us today, knowing that, Lord, we need to do better and bigger things. That you have this enormous opportunity for us to go out and love you and love people. This enormous opportunity to go out and tell others what you've done in our life. We have this incredible door of opportunity to go out and do your will and be your witnesses. Now, God, I pray that you'll speak to hearts today. Lead us in this time of invitation, in this time of dedication, whatever this time is, whatever you want to use it for, God. Lord, we open up to you today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. As we stand and sing, you respond accordingly to how the Lord has led you. This altar is open. If you need to bring something to it, bring it, please. you hold up there for just a second the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 6 but we are all as an unclean thing and all of our righteousness the best we have 
is like filthy rags. It's just like that old dirty, sweaty hanky. That's what our, that, the best, the very best of us, the very best, best person in here, the most righteous person in here, it's like filthy rags. But here's what God says. There's nothing that we can do that will ever be good enough. But the Bible tells us how to obtain righteousness. He says this in Romans chapter 10, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. Heads bowed and eyes closed this morning. You can put your books away. With heads bowed and eyes closed, I won't. I, I just feel so strongly. Would there be one this morning to say, Brother Wade, I am just not sure. I'm not 100% absolute sure of my salvation, and I want you to be praying for me. I've got doubts. I've got some issues I'm dealing with here, and I just, I, I'm, I'm not sure. Would there be one just to lift your hand? Nobody's looking around. Thank you. Thank you. See, there's several. I know we're dealing with many things in our life. But I want you to leave here today knowing 100% beyond a shadow of a doubt. See, to be 90% sure you're 100% wrong. I want you to know I want you to know that you know that you know that you're saved. And if you was to draw your last breath like we've seen many this past week, that you know exactly where you'll go. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray in Jesus' name, Lord, that you would speak to that heart, that heart, God, that's unsure. And I pray, Lord, I pray heaven upon this place and that your Holy Spirit would just come and just assure people. God, if there's someone here today that needs to speak it in their mouth, if there's someone here today that needs to make a public confession, maybe make a public profession by coming to the altar, Lord, we want them to have the power, the ability, and the freedom to do just that in Jesus' name. As she plays... Oh, we're just standing here in reverence because God is moving and God is working. If you need to be at this altar, please come now. It's between you and the Lord. But if you need to be here, I need you to come on now. Don't worry about what anybody else might think. Just do right and be right with God. Know that you can leave here today with absolute assurance. Somebody else that needs to be at this altar to give thanks to the Lord. my heart that God's dealing with somebody here today and you may or may not feel like you should be at this altar but trust me when I say God's for you and God loves you and he's going to go with you and if I or the deacons or Sunday school teachers or somebody else you trust you need to speak with you get in touch okay In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you for being here uh, today. We need to meet with um, anybody that works with kids or youth or music or anything to do. We're starting to plan the what we're going to do for Christmas. need to get some dates. We're going to meet right down here and it won't be but for a few minutes. So if some of you that's going to 
go on the beach trip. I know you're ready to go, but it'll be there when you get there. <laughs> so I promise you, a couple minutes is all we're going to be. So um, Brother Larry Blevins, you dismiss us in prayer, and then we'll have the meeting right down here. Amen. God bless everybody. Thank you, Larry.
they recover it, the things we're doing here, take things from him, and then let him assist himself, like we did that one year, then have the fellowship afterwards, do that with these things, and then what all, what all we do, I mean, if you want to do that. I need to find two other men to be with me to be wise men. something about doing something on Wednesday night. What would you... Just me, Fred, I started this week and just got to do it. Okay, so that could probably... Uh, we'll have to talk to Jessica, but I'm sure she'd be open to, to some of the all times she does a craft. Do you want me to assist you? I mean, I can have that. So why not, I mean, it, so you're talking about doing it just one Wednesday night, and you're talking about the 18th, the Wednesday night, is, that's the last Wednesday night before Christmas. Okay. So that would, that and that's after this, yeah. so that will work out great. Yeah. All right. Okay. Sounds good. Sounds good. All right.